Welcome to Kink Geek with your hosts, Step and Tams. We're here to take a nerd's eye view of everything from sexuality to pop culture and whatever we hit along the way. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a real good time. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Weird Science episode of Kink Geek. That's kind of funny that you put it that way. I like that. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Well, I was just thinking about our fish cookies. Oh. <laughs> it's it's funny. Delicious chocolate chip cookies and a satisfactory cup of tea can sometimes meld in strange ways. Yeah, it was weird. I made cookies and then we had a sip of tea and he's like, it tastes like lobster. Like, what? So that was bizarre. It, it was absolutely bizarre. But welcome to episode, uh-oh, what is this, 89? 89. Of Kink Geek. I'm Steph. I'm Tams. As always. And um, we are full of interesting factoids today. But first, I wanted to start us off with a pitch for our patreon Mm -hmm. Uh, shameless self-promotion if you hey that used to be a hashtag i used all the time on twitter (laughs) patreon is a great way to support content creators like us Uh, if you feel like we have enriched your lives in any way even if it's just listening to us babble and uh, enjoying Mm -hmm. our company every week then you can think about supporting us via our patreon the link is patreon.com slash Kinky. 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 Yeah. And uh, there you will find all our patron bonuses as well as um, have the opportunity to support us for as little uh, as a dollar a month, a dollar an episode. Any, or a one time donation of a dollar if you like. Anything will help us continue to put out our content, which is and shall always be free. But, uh, y- you know, we have to fund this thing somehow. So. That is through the support of our patrons. Mm -hmm. So it's been a week, hasn't it? A week and a bit. (laughs) A week and a bit, yeah. And there's a good reason for that, as I'm sure there always is with everyone. Life is crazy, and uh, we've had to learn to kind of go with the flow and stop fighting it and just come up with a better way to do things. So Mm -hmm. that's part of what we're here to talk about. We have talked about the fact that we moved Mm -hmm. into a new location, a new studio, a new space, um, and along with that move came a bunch of other life shifts, which um, some of which are relevant and some of which are not, but mostly it just means that um, our schedule, our our weekly uh, routine has been completely uh, upended, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um, through that we find that in order to get a podcast um, recorded, edited, and put out between, uh, what is it, Sunday night and Tuesday mm-hmm. uh, afternoon, is just not uh, leaving us with time to give the quality that we really want for our uh, Kink Geek podcast. So we've decided to change our release schedule to Fridays mm-hmm. um, because the top half of our week is always really, really full and the bottom of half of our week we're kind of twiddling our thumbs. Mm-hmm. So if we can record Thursday, Friday, put out a, a good um, meaty content filled episode, then I think that will work better for everybody. I think so. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess is more the case. The things that are kind of top heavy in our week is, you know, like a new job for me. Mm-hmm. Things that just we can't we can't change. move. Yeah, it's it's not in our power. So I think all around this is going to be better for us and better for everyone else in the long run. Mm-hmm. We can provide more. Um, it's, I mean, for me, it's not enough to provide good content and an episode every week. I really want to get back to being able to put it out at a specific time with a consistent high level of quality yeah. mm-hmm. and uh it it's kind of uh unfortunate that it happened this week when we were going to be talking about halloween on tuesday but if you're anything like us when halloween comes and goes you're kind of like i would like more halloween <laughs> so we're here kind of to talk about that yeah we're gonna talk um, about that as well but first i hear you had some uh some interesting new experiences yesterday. 
Mm, I did. I or did. familiar, but new, but familiar? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out how best to, to talk about this. So we talked, I don't know, two or three episodes ago mm -hmm. about now that we're in a new space, being able to really start to focus more on DS stuff. Having the freedom, the... Uh... Um, isolation, not isolation, but we are not living with people anymore. Mm -hmm, the privacy. Mm -hmm. And not only just DS stuff, but, you know, just play in general and that sort of thing. So we made a start. And uh, I think first we're going to talk about how that's going, because we talked about a few little rules that we would do. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how well those have stuck. Mm -hmm. um, spoiler alert, not very well. Mm-hmm. So one of the big ones is um, waiting to come into your office when you are there. I rarely remember. Yeah, you just kind of completely forgot. Yeah, and to be fair, you also completely forgot and didn't correct well, me on it. <laughs> it's, it. I'm busy and in the middle of stuff and can't always... For, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we've both been failing on that front. So that's something that we are both aware of now. Mm -hmm. And we've both got to work to uh get better at i think because it's the choice that we have right mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. what we've decided to implement so we need to make sure that we actually implement that yeah because for me when we're not doing stuff i feel a little empty yeah i kind of like oh we don't care enough to do this mm -hmm. i guess our relationship isn't important enough to do this and that's not a fun place to be no and it happens a lot of times just because life is pressing, yeah. but you need to make your relationship part of your routine. And that's something we're really trying to focus on learning mm -hmm. <laughs> because, um, like, for example, this week we had Halloween, of course, mm -hmm. and which meant we were going to our card shop for league that week. <laughs> but then a couple of days before the game shop owner was like, hey, if you wear a costume, you get free product. So Steph and I both went, costumes? Heck yeah. I will have uh, use any excuse to dress up in mm -hmm. costumes. So, so I will um, tweet out and put on the, the, the website the pictures from it. And it turned out well. But what that meant is that for two or three days, there was frantic activity trying to get ready, trying to get costumes together. Mm. And things that wouldn't normally be part of what we were doing and it pushed a lot of other stuff aside and that's always going to happen in life but we're still getting to the point where we can swing with that so well i haven't had a weekend since we moved in there's been yeah. something happening that has directed whether i've had to work over the weekend or whether there's just been um extra um moving mm -hmm. stuff like my mother still uh needs help around her house so yeah because of the sale, selling yeah. yeah so it's been crazy and that means for us that it's always a struggle to find time i mean our own stuff our own relationship gets put to the back and that is something we are going to be changing for not just us but for you the listeners mm -hmm. because we realize that we've kind of fallen back from where we want to be as far as um podcasters and being able to share the DS components mm -hmm. of, of our lives. And we've not been particularly strong in that as of a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is something we're really working on. And uh, hopefully it will be helpful for other people in similar situations. Yeah. So to f jump forward now to yesterday, um, you were at your computer, just came home from work, was doing some stuff and I came in and didn't have a cup of tea didn't have a cup of tea uh, <laughs> you had a cup of tea today though I did I remembered uh, girl. and we chit chatted for a few minutes and then you started tapping my cheeks with the flat of your hands doing it now is probably not the best idea because you're gonna distract me <laughs> fair enough <laughs> um, so you started that and uh, boy, you're just pinchy and slap. With the... You have hands. Keep them to yourself. <laughs> oh, oh my... no, 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 no. <laughs> so um, this wound up being a um, 15, 10, 15 minute 
session of, of slap play, which is something that for me is, I consider for myself edge play. Not because I find it particularly dangerous because it's never that hard, but because for me, there's a lot of emotional stuff tied up in it. And um, so it's a difficult thing for me. Not only does it come in with pain play, but there's also fear play as well for me. And um, it, it's the kind of pain that I have difficulty with because I'm not good at just standing there and waiting for it. <laughs> so we uh, played for a little while and you did, did it in a manner that I found much easier to deal with because you started off just back and forth lightly and then got harder and then went to like kind of the surprise smacks, which are the ones that I hate the most because they're so difficult. I wasn't sure as it was happening how comfortable you were with it. I mean, we have safe words in place for mm -hmm. that reason, but uh, you seemed to be really struggling. I was really struggling for a lot of reasons. Um, I have always found it easier to play in these kinds of manners, in this kind of play, with a clearly defined playtime play space. So it's much easier for you to say to me in the morning, hey, tonight when I get home, I'm gonna have tea, we're gonna hang out for a little bit, and then we're gonna work on slapping play so that I can get my headset there. I know that what's going on is something that has been uh, structured and I expect it. You would never slap me for any other reason than in play, and knowing that it would be consensual. But there is still that instinctive part of my brain that when I'm not expecting that kind of thing, that immediately scrambles to figure out what's going on. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Is this because he's mad at me for something? And it's just a, a fraction of a moment or two, but it, it's really difficult to try to wrap my brain around. So that's always uh, something that I struggle with. And that especially, that kind of play, which mm -hmm. is why um, we I think we've talked before about when out of the blue, you suddenly slap me really hard on the butt, hard enough to like jar me mm -hmm. um, that I find it. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I can accept it, but I don't like it because it's that out of context pain. And I don't really like pain unless it's in context. Mm. So um, it was a struggle. It was. And. Once you switch to the more, I didn't know where it was coming from or what side it was coming from, it, it got harder and harder and harder until it was just really hard and you stopped. Um, I wouldn't, I wasn't terribly close to wording, but it was on the horizon. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it was hard. And then we went and snuggled. You You stopped and you're like, okay, okay. And then you took me to the bedroom to snuggle. You were a little dizzy. I was a little... Come on. Of course I was dizzy. I wasn't expecting it. And there's all those weird chemicals surging through your body. And uh, yeah, but we snuggled for a while. And it gives me some downtime to process because that's what I need to do. Well, that's aftercare, right? Yeah. And you had said, of course, you know, if you need... We're going to talk... You want to talk about this? We're going to talk about this. But when you're ready, let me know. And uh, it gives me time to process it out and get out of that. Because frankly, sometimes I get angry and it's, I'm not actually angry at you. I'm angry at the pain. Well, it's a fight the or flight fear. response. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's hard. And I don't, it, it's not indicative of not wanting to because now I'm like, hey, let's go do that again. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in the space, I'm going to be like, I hate you so much right now. That's just for me part of it. But um, it was... I found it easier than I anticipated. Um, it was really cool because the trust, I could feel the trust there really strongly, mm -hmm. which we haven't done that kind of thing in a while. So that was, uh, it was a good experience and I'm looking forward to doing more interesting, different things that we haven't done in a while or don't ever do. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so that was our yesterday, which was good. And now we're here today. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for today, we have a few 
little surprises that were going to be Halloween-y, but now they're just sort of anytime uh, delights. <laughs> and I think this is probably a good time to slip in one of the um, short pieces of fiction that we have prepared. Sounds good to me. I am afraid of them. The mere thought of them lurking in hidden places, hiding in the great wide open, chills me like blue flame. They act like they can't see me, but they do. They always do. They flaunt their superiority, laugh at our frailties, and murder our children. They seek to dominate, eradicate us from the earth, to claim their spot at the top of the food chain. We must fight back. We must protect what is ours. I have been elected to lead the fight. I can feel the weight of our race heavy on my shoulders and in my heart. Not all of us wishes to fight them, some even wish to join them. I try not to think about such things. I am to be a champion, a slayer, if you will, or perhaps murderer, a small voice in my head whispers. I push the voice aside and enter the small room where my hunting team awaits me. I can see Sarah and James standing together next to a large stone fireplace. Shadows and light thrown by the flickering fire play across their faces, and I am struck by how young they look. They should be thinking about living and falling in love, not hunting and trying to save us all from extinction. I can hear snippets of their conversation. Garlic and crosses? Sarah asks. <laughs> not effective at all, James replies, rolling his eyes. Ah, the modern media. What a poor excuse for an education. James sees me first and falls silent. Sarah turns her head and locks eyes with me. I can read fear and sadness there. They both walk towards me. Soon, the rest follow suit. Marcus and Paul, Rachel, Mary, and Nick. Soon they and all the rest are gathered around me. They don't speak a word. It's almost time, I begin. The sky is about to change color again, and so we must go. This is the time of day they are the weakest. There is a soft murmuring as fear and tension begin to grow. I hold up my hand. My friends, this is not a decision we have made lightly. It is something that must be done. I look at Sarah as one tear rolls down her cheek. But they just don't understand, she begins. I silence her with a look. And they never will. I reply sadly and smile softly at her, bearing my pointed fangs. Another night of hunting begins. So that was fun. <laughs> you want to tell me a little bit about writing that? Okay, so that was called Humans Being, mm -hmm. and that is a story that I wrote. Uh, you called it flash fiction, I think? Yeah, anything, I think anything that t takes less than five minutes to write, read, I mm -hmm. would consider flash fiction. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this was something that uh, was given to me about six years ago, seven years ago, in university. In as my, a writing prompt? As a writing requirement in our humanities uh, uh, class, which was my all-time favorite course ever. Changed my life. Amazing. Great teacher, great TA. Um, and it was about othering and the unexpected. So they wanted, the, the, the professor wanted us to write something in which um, you are subverting what you expect mm. to to have happen and um i don't think subverting expectations is really something that uh most writers have any trouble with it's almost the the goal of yeah, a lot of fiction yeah. that i read but to really turn it on its head to write it in yeah. a manner that you're as you're reading along you're not even you're just instinctively knowing what the story is about until mm -hmm. the end and then you're like oh mm -hmm. wait a minute um it was part of a larger theme of othering people and um, subverting the dominant fantasy and such. But okay. I, of course, being me, chose to write something supernatural because that's just me. 
So uh, it's going. It's part of a greater world that I'm thinking of playing in at some point, mm-hmm. um, as a lot of my stuff is. But yeah, so that was my little window into this world. Well, speaking of the supernatural, uh, why don't we hop into our main topic now, which is where are your show notes? There they are. Uh, something called exophilia. Um, mm-hmm. Or, now I'm going to paraphrase the definition because I don't, I don't like that definition. Sure. Exophilia is an erotic attachment to exotic creatures or exotic uh, entities. So, things like aliens, demons, robots, ghosts, mm-hmm. um, ghouls. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but often have kind of a, a human-ish either form or, or personality or aspects to them yeah. that can be, you know, some aspect which can be uh, thought of as sexual. Mm-hmm. And I mean, in some degree, this is very, very common. You think about the number of sexy vampire books that are out there these days. I think we've talked about it on this very podcast. Mm-hmm. About, you know. Um, vampires, werewolves, all of these primal creatures have a sexual aspect in the horror that they come from. Mm -hmm. Because humans are really just scared of their own sexuality (laughs) a lot of times. Well, this goes right back to, you know, Dracula, the original Dracula. And it comes all the way forward. I read um, Laurel K. Hamilton's Anita Blake series. Mm -hmm. And that has her having sexual relations with vampires and with werewolves and I should really give her um what's her what's the name gentry series another oh the the look. Uh, mary gentry yeah because it's i really good. like the fae uh um you know mythos mm-hmm. so well something else this is i don't know if we talked about this before and this is definitely a little aside but um for people like us who are poly uh huh if you read her series, the Anita Blake series again, knowing that she would by towards the end of it as a writer come out as Polly, mm. it really makes the character and the relationships make a lot more sense because you have Anita getting into multiple partnered relationships. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's kind of And I think Mary Gentry does that too. Yeah. Um, and that makes me think I should have picked a different choice for my story which will be coming up later because i have something a novel in the works that tackles these very topics in a supernatural fit kind of way i think that's really cool Mm -hmm. there needs to be more of it out there which is yeah and more taking it seriously like there's plenty of porn Mm -hmm. and there's some erotica and the difference between porn and erotica i think are are vast and not well understood Mm -hmm. and maybe that's just my own snootiness but (laughs) <laughs> anyway, I think um, there needs to be more widely read literature. Mm-hmm. Like, I would love to see a, a teen lit or a YA novel where instead of the um, the heroine being chased by two guys and having to pick and they hate each other and mm-hmm. oh, the angst that they just kind of make it work, that would be great. Yeah, <laughs> like that novel that I know I've mentioned on here before, um... Night of Ghosts and Shadows, and that's mm-hmm. basically what it is, mm-hmm. is the three of them create a trail, which is really cool. So getting back to our topic, mm-hmm. um, where do you want to start digging into this? Because there's, like, exophilia almost isn't just one thing. I would consider um, maybe demons and extraterrestrials to be sort of similar, but not even, I don't think, because oftentimes demons have the overture of the um, religious aspect. The This is the worst of the worst that you can be doing. Sure, but there's always that malevolent presence when you're talking about extraterrestrials in a um, in their usual setting mm-hmm. outside of, well, I don't know. In a horror setting, they're always a villain because you need a villain in horror in a sci-fi setting they're sometimes just um uh, stand-ins for exotic peoples Mm -hmm. like other uh, ethnicities Mm. um but the exophilia um kink i think really leans more toward the um 
the otherworldly and away from the stand-ins kind of role. Hmm. Or am I wrong there? Well, it's a blanket term for anything that is non-human, basically. Um, excluding, I think, um, when you get into bestiality type hmm. thing. This is um, non-human, non real i guess for mm -hmm. want of a better phrase but this like, is one of those kinks that you can't really actually satisfy uh in the real world setting uh unlike you know whips and chains and punishment mm -hmm. but there are ways and actually we have some um toys that are related to this that we will link in the show notes mm -hmm. um especially my uh good good friends and by friends i mean i've never actually met them but i love their stuff over at bad dragon mm -hmm. uh actually you want to mention what they just came yes, out yes absolutely so i will preface this by saying as you all know steph and i are huge horror movie horror tv fans yeah and we watch stranger things yeah. so when we found out that bad dragon not only came out with a stranger things inspired toy they did a seven minute video and i'm talking like they use movie quality cameras by the looks of it high quality production values um promo stranger things riff horror short to promote this product i was two thumbs up and it's phenomenal so why don't you talk about what it is so it's called the demogorgon <laughs> and it looks like an alien phallus or like almost a um seed pod ended tentacle mm -hmm. you know it looks like the closed mouth of the demogorgon they, mm. like it could open but it it can't because it's you know poured molded uh, latex mm -hmm. but their toys are just very high quality mm -hmm. and their um, process for making them they actually have a way of layering colors and tones mm -hmm. to give something a real a lively look to it mm. like a lot of poured latex you get the swirly pattern or the speckles or stars or whatever mm. but this has different shades the gradation the between yeah. the colors yeah <clears throat> and to be fair and or not to be fair to be clear we are not sponsored in any way shape or form they don't know we exist no um, although, we just appreciate their... if anyone out there is listening we can hook you up with some sweet uh promotional yeah, we'd be more than happy to try all of your products for you. Yeah. Um, but no, we have friends who have the stuff and have seen it, and it's fantastic. So. I believe they did have a lifetime warranty on their uh, insertables. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll link all of those. There are all sorts of interesting Halloween -y wonders. <laughs> There's also, I think there was a crucifix tipped dildo and all sorts oh, of other... all sorts of ridiculous stuff right, we found a bunch we'll link in the show notes so you guys can go have a look um but moving back to demons for a second okay for me the vast difference for me in fantasizing between a demon and a um extraterrestrial is for me a demon is a line that to me as somebody who while I didn't grow up in a religious household, I always considered myself a Christian and mm -hmm. um, religious in that respect. So to me, it was like the ultimate thing I should not do. It's almost a sin. Okay. So it has that extra kind of no, no, oh my gosh, that's hot to it. Whereas opposed to aliens, uh, you probably shouldn't mess with the little gray men, but it's not something that is a sin per se. And the reason that I sort of put them together in the same um category mm -hmm. is a lot of the tonal qualities are the same uh being tied down or otherwise um restrained having things done to you mm -hmm. it's a lot of the uh alien abduction slash demonic um possession or rape fantasy have a lot of the same elements and it's, it's perfect that you put it that way, because this is where it's going to get interesting, because my demon kind of fantasies are not of that sort. Are um, you more of the demon summoning type of fantasy? No, not at all. Completely a third type. Um, I guess we can call it demon seduced. And it all goes back to a film that I saw when I was quite young, 
and it was an 80s film and i believe it was rutger hauer played this demon Mm. who seduces this woman and there is this really explicit to my young eyes sex scene where he's got his horns and he's thrusting into her and like it's very explicit and it's a whole you gotta find this movie because yeah. I, haven't, I haven't even heard of it it was good um and it was a rosemary's baby-esque type okay. film but she was um kind of entranced into mm. it so it is kind of consensual non-consent but there wasn't any there was mind control element yeah it wasn't violent in Mm. that respect and that just kind of set me on that um we'll Well, talk sorry go ahead that is almost identical to the typical vampire seduction kind of scene very much so mesmerism yeah yeah with for me that added this is a definite thing you shouldn't do and my kind of uh interest in demonic things i can trace right back to my first computer that i ever got Mm -hmm. and my very first drawing in paint i've showed it to you before you should definitely put it up in the show notes it's of a um, or on twitter it's of a uh, demon standing holding his erect penis while there's a woman tied up next to him looking actually if you tweet it with this uh week's episode we might get some more interest from people who uh (laughs) want to want to retweet it sure you guys can all laugh at my horrible horrible paint drawing skills but uh i was very years ago right? i was so proud of this i mean i drew this hand drew it using stupid paint and i'm not an artist (laughs) so it was pretty cool so yeah it goes back that far um okay so what about you any um i mean i've got other things and we'll get there but what is something that you kind of like there are a bunch of different aspects for me like obviously the orion slave girls from star trek are those that's more the stand-in for other races although i didn't think about it that way at that time mm-hmm. um but green women you know is kind of sexy mm-hmm. um uh, what about the three-breasted woman from uh... absolutely from total recall yeah three-breasted woman um was just so fascinating i was like is that possible that's that can't be possible and then i mean as a child you don't really know yeah. what what how anatomy works like there was a time that i didn't realize anal sex was a thing like i thought it was just you know sex from behind uh, <laughs> but uh the uh three-breasted woman was uh something i thought maybe i'll find that for real someday and <laughs> maybe there's you know a strip club out there somewhere but uh the real turning point for uh demon seduction porn Mm -hmm. was um finding anime early yeah late night anime brought from overseas la blue Mm -hmm. girl was a big one yep me too this is like way back in the day and uh then later i found urutsuki doji which was like it's intense i don't think you've seen it have you no it was the thing that popularized tentacles in uh oh, anime i do like me some tentacles though so, boy howdy that's a thing mm-hmm. um and then of course other things like the um the dracula movie with keanu reeves and those three vampire women very sexy very very, very sexy, sexy. Mm-hmm. so i guess i was exposed to all sorts of different imagery for um exophilia before having a specific interest mm-hmm. but it has blossomed absolutely because i'm a um a speculative kind of guy mm-hmm. so narrative fiction and speculative fiction have always sort of um had this appeal me too it's always been my jam so to speak one of the earliest things i remember reading as far as or as far as being sexually aware was actually a story with a robot mm-hmm a woman having sex with a robot interesting Mm -hmm. so i think for me my ultimate um monster kind of sexy monster like is a clive barker novel Mm. called nightbreed and it is a story in which hi draft cat look at salem i'm sorry buddy um steph just got home and hasn't really 
pet Salem much, so Salem has decided, I'm going to come visit. Mm. Um, So Nightbreed is essentially a story in which the monsters that live in Midian are not actually the bad people of the story. Mm -hmm. That's a common thread for Clive Barker stuff. He also, was he also uh, the uh, Hellraiser guy? Yeah. Yeah. He deals a lot with, again, um, others, people who are othered. Mm. that are not the mainstream and uh you know i don't know anything about him personally but i would imagine he fits into some sort of generally othered group i think he's gay okay um i don't quote me on it but i'm don't pretty sure i'm pretty sure um but yeah this story first of all it's a phenomenal story i just really enjoyed it but there is this scene in which um the main female character and her lover who has died and been brought back through his contact with Midian he is no longer human he's cold and everything else and how she has sex with him knowing he's this quote unquote monster and he's less of a monster than the serial killer in the story hmm. and it was it's just a really sexy scene and i was like oh man oh man so yeah that was a that was a big thing for me and um, there's always been lots and lots of films out there that, you know, kind of have that sexiness to it. We've talked before about um, Waxwork, in which there's a vampire that is featured in it. And again, it's one of those things where you know they're the bad guy, they're going to kill you, but it's just so dark and sexy. So... Yeah. Yeah, we actually did that for uh, Kink Geek Watches, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. We covered wax work. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't wa- or listened to that yet, you can go and find our other podcast, mm-hmm. Kink Geek Watches. Mm-hmm. It's in the show notes down below. Is it? Okay. So I've, yeah, definitely had a long-running fascination. I can remember when I was living alone for the first time lying in my room late at night and my bedroom had no windows. It was, you walked in the front door and there was a living room and a kitchen. And then you walked into another room and it was a bedroom and there were just, it was just a big square room. You know, I've never lived alone. Really? I've always had a roommate. Interesting. So there are not many nights when I have been by myself in the house. There have been a few and every time I realize, you know what, I've never really been alone before. That's interesting. It is. I lived alone a lot, and I think that helped feed and fuel a lot of this stuff for me. Mm. Because I'd lie there and be like, wouldn't it be nice if there was just this entity that wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> that could do what I wanted or, uh-huh. you know, ravage me here? Um, it's also kind of scary. But, uh, yeah, it definitely was an interesting time. Mm. So... So shall we move on to our next little piece of goodness? Sure. What are we what are what are we playing? Um I think we're playing your contribution. All right. And when okay. we're when it's over, we'll come back and talk a little bit about it. Okay. Okay. You always expect haunted things to be old and ornate, like a big oak armoire or a silver hairbrush. The dresser in his bedroom was neither. At best, it was probably made up of chipboard, and he doubted the mirror was backed with silver. That was a thing, right? Silver and mirrors? It didn't really matter. The first time he'd seen her, she was sitting in front of the mirror. Or at least, she was in the mirror. He'd heard a soft humming from the doorway, and he'd gone in anyway, thinking maybe he'd left the radio on. He hadn't found a phone or a radio. What he'd found was a ghost. He wasn't immediately freaked out, probably because he was never much for scary movies. Mostly, they were always just so cornball. What the hell would a malevolent spirit gain from terrorizing some poor schmucks who just wanted to spend a weekend fucking in the woods? No, movies were silly. What he had spent time on were old stories from the South. Family ghosts that sang children to sleep, or walked solemnly around graveyards with parasols to ward off the full moon. No, the ghost didn't bother him in particular, but he was fascinated. 
And that first time he'd seen her, he'd just watched her until she disappeared. After that, he spent a lot of time staring into his mirror. Sometimes she'd appear, sometimes not. Either way, he would spend hours thinking about her. Who was she? She looked young, blonde, and pretty. The mirror was one of those floating things attached to the dresser by a small post. It was probably from the 80s, but his ghost didn't have a perm or anything. In fact, her long hair was almost perfectly straight. She'd been brushing it when he'd saw her, and she wore a poofy blouse. What did he know? Maybe it was an antique and the mirror was added later. As it went on, she began to appear more often, and he would spend more and more time listening to her hum and watching her brush her beautiful hair. She was becoming comfortable with him, too, he could tell. At first, she'd pretended not to notice him, but he caught her now and then, looking, watching him. When he smiled, she smiled back and then she'd fade away, until one day she didn't. They'd held eye contact for almost a full minute while she brushed her hair, and then she did that thing, pulling it over her shoulder to brush the other side, but this time she wasn't humming. She stopped to watch him, then, ever so slowly, she began to unbutton her blouse. It's an odd thing seeing a ghost, even when you're used to it, it's hard to focus on the phantom. She wasn't pale, he noticed. Her skin looked flushed, in fact, as she slid the blouse over her bare shoulder. It was just translucent, so that he could see himself through her. She held her hand over her bare breast, and they watched each other silently. Still, she didn't fade away. She let her hand fall away, and he took in the sight of her tender breast. She had never stayed so long, and never so silently. When their eyes met again, she seemed solemn, or perhaps resolute. She seemed to stand, and as he watched, she walked away from him to sit, and then lay down on the reflection of his bed. He had to look over his shoulder to be sure she wasn't really laying there, but when he looked back, he saw she was gone. He sighed softly and stood up from his chair. He'd brought it into the bedroom just to watch her. She never reappeared twice in one night, so he knew he was done. But she'd filled him with such a longing. He walked over and lay down on the bed to think, and for the first time, he felt her. It was like an icy hand on his chest and he felt the excitement course through him. Her fingers traced a path along his chest, down to one side. She was holding him, like a lover with cold hands. He hadn't done it the first night, too afraid of offending her. Soon, though, it was every night. He had come to expect her icy hand to travel his body as he pleasured himself. She began to appear naked in front of him, either smiling in the mirror or laying on his bed, inviting him to join her. Her hands became bolder, and she was able, with some kind of ethereal magic, to make him come. The chill of her hand gripping him was enough to stir his loins, but not quite enough to satisfy his desire, and as he began to wish for more than touch of her hand, he imagined holding her as she held him. He imagined the feeling of her breasts on his lips, or better yet, a kiss. He told her then that he loved her, a whisper on the wind. The next night she didn't come, nor the night after. He waited. When finally she appeared, she wouldn't hum. She wouldn't smile. She just stared at him until he sat down. Then, her expression evoking he couldn't tell what, she placed her hand on the mirror, her fingers pressed flat as against a window. Without a word, he leaned forward and pressed his hand to hers, 
feeling the cold glass under his palm. She bit her lip. She'd never done that before. They both rose as though they'd decided to do it together and went to his bed. He lay there for a long time, wondering if he'd pushed her away, if he'd somehow made it impossible for her to reach him. Then he felt her cold hand on his chest. It was the last thing he ever felt. Oh boy, that was sexy. Oh, you liked that one, did you? Oh man, I liked that one a lot. That was pretty good. I'm, I'm never sure about what I'm writing, especially when I haven't edited it like 3,000 times, and yeah. I haven't actually edited this one at all. Yeah, well, this is just going live. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> but you think it was alright? I really enjoyed it. Okay. I like that kind of interesting, sexy kind of... Um, kind of story. Well, I actually wrote it specifically for this episode um, because I wanted something to give, to evoke basically what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, That otherness and the allure of exotic um, beings. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, demons and stuff like that, but mirrors, uh, mirrored images, and things ghost. seen <laughs> in imi- uh, in mirrors is a very uh, popular uh, t- topic as well. You see it in everything from sexy stuff like you just showed mm-hmm. to um, that Doctor Who episode where he traps Someone in the bad mirror. person in the mirror forever. And there's an episode of Supernatural where... Um, Bloody Mary mm-hmm. comes out of the mirror. Well, even the story of Bloody Mary or... Mm-hmm. Um, Candyman. Uh, yeah. Or um, in uh, Superman, the Phantom Zone, they were inside sort of a mirror. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I I think, though I'm not sure, that um, I've heard stories that old mirrors, like silver-backed mirrors, mm-hmm. could actually trap images. Like if, if it was in a room for a long time, time and had the sun shining on it and someone was sat in front of it every day it's sort of like uh taking a photograph interesting you know? mm-hmm. um because the silver is it silver nitrate is the same stuff that photographers use interesting. like the it's what you think of the silver screen mm-hmm. um that may be a myth but it did evoke this sort of idea for you concept yeah mm-hmm. i really found it sexy so good job Thank you. Um, yeah, and we haven't talked about spirits yet, uh, but those are definitely in with the uh, xenophilia kind of uh, umbrella. Mm-hmm. Exophilia? Exophilia. Xenophilia is... Something al- else. Aliens. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think there's a lot of reasons why people like the idea of ghostly kind of sex and I think it comes from different places you have people who have lost someone Mm -hmm. and are looking to reconnect with somebody that they're they're missing so you have that aspect of it and you have actually products that are geared to that too yes you do there's actually a dildo out there that we may have mentioned before but there's Mm -hmm. a a newer one that can hold the ashes of your loved one Mm mm-hmm so that they can be in you. I, it, it's really um, awkward to try to market something like that, but I understand the appeal for. I can understand uh, why some people, especially would like monogamous it. people who've yeah. spent their whole lives with a person. A person. Yeah, I yeah. can. I can get it. So yeah, that exists out there. Um, and you just, I mean, there was Ghost, the movie Ghost. Oh yeah. And um, there's that longing feeling. But there's also the, you know, the the succubus kind of that's aspect. also, like, crosses over into the demonic. But there's, a little bit, yeah. Well, I mean, a succubus is traditionally a demon. A, a something, yeah. But uh, all of these things connect in certain ways. So, yeah. It's very interesting. Have you ever had one of those... Uh, Ghostly fantasies? Um, well, do you remember Ghostbusters? I do. 
the scene with uh, Ray and the ghost woman mm-hmm. in the um, firehouse. Yep. So that always kind of struck a chord. Interesting. <laughs> For me, it was that scene in The Shining, that terrible, horrible scene in the bathtub, mm. which up to a certain point, it was really sexy. Oh, and then man, did Kubrick... That... Stabbed a knife in my heart. Did that but, get you? Yeah. But that was perfectly aligned with the kind of uh, horror yeah, yeah. elements from uh, the uh, being afraid of the se- the human sexual nature mm-hmm. and fear of death and disease. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that all twisted up together is pretty potent. Potent. Absolutely. All right. Shall we move <laughs> into our? final little piece of of uh halloweeny goodness well i think is that going to be what finishes us off well we're going to talk about it afterwards okay and then, you know have our say our goodbyes and everything so yeah okay all right we will be right back when you finish listening october was generally a cool crisp month in southern ontario A month Megan looked forward to all summer long. Not one for heat or sweating, the in summer decided to visit. Today, though, the intense midday sun pounding down on her head and shoulders was something to which Megan was oblivious. As her runners struck the pavement in a steady rhythmic slap, all she could focus on was pushing forward. Her honey-colored hair streamed out behind her, the sunlight picking out the red and blonde strands, shifting, floating, giving her appearance a shimmery, ethereal look. Arms tucked close to her body, she pushed herself to move faster. Her body surged forward and her feet seemed to barely touch the ground. Megan had decided to take up running over a year earlier. She had been looking for something to help her deal with the stress of being a medical intern. Long, idle hours spent in cerebral pursuits had taken its toll on her body, and when one of her professors had suggested that taking up exercise would help with her anxiety as well, she figured it was worth a try. In the first few weeks, Meg had almost quit a dozen times. It was an almost unbearable struggle to drag herself out the door and run. Her legs had burned, her chest had heaved, but she kept going. Unlike a lot of her friends who also ran, she never did grow to enjoy it. She liked it for what it did to her anxiety levels, but most of all, she kept at it because of her loved ones. Her grandparents and parents had a history of high blood pressure and heart problems, and Meg decided that she owed it to herself and her family to do everything she could to combat that history. So every time she strapped on her shoes, she thought of her dad, who died when she was only 12 of a heart attack, of her grandfather, whom she had never had the chance to meet, and of her mom, more like a best friend than a mother to her, who battled her own heart attack only two years earlier and had won. She thought about them all, and this time was no different. As the air was ripped from her lungs in gasping breaths, Megan's mind couldn't help picturing her family's faces in her mind. Step after step, she pushed on, only peripherally aware of the people sitting on benches, their noses buried in cell phones, laptops, and tablets as she flew by them. Turning a corner, Megan stumbled over a crack in the pavement, causing her to pinwheel her arms, desperately trying to stop herself from falling. As she twisted to halt her downward momentum, she could see behind her, and her heart flared painfully against her chest. She burst forward like an Olympic sprinter, fear clawing its way up her throat, her body no longer controlled by her mind, but instead a mindless instinct for self-preservation. She managed half a dozen steps before being struck hard from behind, and felt herself again pitching forward. At the last moment, she tilted her pelvis backwards in a way that allowed her to fall backwards instead of face down. As she connected with the pavement, she brought her palms up in an attempt to keep her attacker from pinning her to the ground. She struggled against the heavy weight pressing on her, and her heart lurched again as the person's face came into sharp relief. The figure was male, with dark hair that flopped boyishly across his forehead. His eyes were watery and lifeless, fixed on some point beyond her, the tear ducts crusted with milky emissions. His nose was crusted with green mucus which had traveled down the lower part of his face and down his neck, thick and plentiful, with the corner of his mouth, chin, and throat also featuring a liberal helping of blood. He pushed forward against her hands, his teeth snapping repeatedly at her face, a low, guttural sound working its way out of his mouth. Meg flailed against the heavy figure, swinging up her legs, kicking and straining her hands to push it off her, but couldn't budge it. 
She turned her face to the side to avoid the teeth catching her nose and noticed a man sitting on a bench a few feet from her, engaged in a phone conversation while fiddling on the phone screen. Meg opened her mouth to yell for help, but paused as she saw a figure coming up behind the man. The figure was very much like the one pinning her to the ground, all lifeless eyes and body secretions. As she took a breath to scream at a warning, she felt a sharp pain in her throat as teeth tore through skin and muscle in a chewing motion. All that came out was a dull gargle. As her vision dimmed, she watched the man on the bench meet the same fate as she, he never really seeing what hit him, his attention focused inward until it was too late. Okay, so that, uh, I've actually read that before. You, uh, you did that a while back for, um, a book that I think you're planning on writing, possibly this nano? Maybe. Yeah, it is, um, from a novel that is currently titled I'll Fall Down, and it is my take on the zombie kind of novel, and it's been in the works since before Walking Dead. Mm Mm-hmm. It's different. It's before Walking Dead, the TV show, right? So yeah, at least seven years. Yeah, we've had this. Yeah, my general premise is um, some. It, it's about moral choices. It's about somebody who knows it's coming because mm-hmm. things that have happened to her, and how do you deal with that? Like, what do you do? People aren't going to listen to you. Nobody's going to believe the zombie apocalypse is coming. Yeah, as a standalone, it's really weird to uh, suddenly have her um looking at people you know with their noses buried in their phones and then oh what there's a zombie after her but uh and that's kind of the point because that's the overarching theme yeah. is how people have so disconnected from one another mm-hmm. especially out and about i mean we still connect with our friends and our families but when you're outside if you're walking down the street if you look around very little interaction goes on. People are always looking at their phones. And it's even more uh, drawing you in than just listening to music on your headphones would be. It's not even just that we're not engaging with people. We're not engaging with our environment, which is sort of what the uh, effect that you got there. Yeah, is that she gets attacked and she's being killed at the feet of this man who's too busy talking on his phone and looking at a screen uh-huh. to even notice before it's too late. So that is the first, that is the prologue for the story. And okay. uh, when it's done, I will let you know if anybody's interested in jumping on and being a, uh, an alpha reader, let me know. I'm always looking for grammatically amazing people or just <laughs> people who enjoy reading and can say, I didn't understand this or this didn't work for me because that's also very helpful. I find that the most helpful Mm -hmm. is when somebody can say, I'm sorry, this didn't make sense to me because most of the time that means that I just haven't been clear enough. And it's important because it makes sense to me. I'm writing it, but if it doesn't make sense to the person reading it, then it's no good. Exactly. So that's definitely something. Um, If you're interested, let us know. So that kind of sums up our little Halloween adventure. Although now that we're talking about writing, I, sh- I guess we should have mentioned this at the top, but we mentioned a couple of episodes back that what we were doing for NaNoWriMo this year. Mm-hmm. And since then, we've kind of had a realization that um, <laughs> the, we didn't have enough time with the moving to properly, um, the moving and setting up, mm-hmm. to properly outline what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And we're still planning on, on doing that we're project. We're still working on it, just not under a time constraint. Not under a time constraint. And that means that we have both decided to do other things for Nano. So I, I don't know if I want to get into it at the bottom of the show, but just an update that we mm-hmm. are still working on that, but it's not going to be a NaNoWriMo kind of thing. And I think that's going to make it better in the long run because we have more, um, it's not even more time. We can just yeah. pace it better so. yeah because the the plan was to write you know our hundred thousand words between the two of us and then not just release it right away to spend the time to edit it but now we're just it's a project that demands enough attention that we want to pace it the way we want to pace it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all right so yeah but if you uh would like to know more you can go back a couple episodes and listen if uh, you have enjoyed this podcast, you can find 
us on iTunes, where you may have already downloaded this episode, or Mm -hmm. in wherever you find your podcasts. And if you could, go and give us a review. That would be great. The old five-star rating would be awesome. And if not that, then just drop us a line sometime. We're on Twitter. We have email. We have a Facebook group. And we have a FetLife group. Mm -hmm. We also are on YouTube. And if you hop on... In the next week or so, there is going to be new content. We've got a video of the new space that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And some more um, videos of Salem, because I know some people really like our little fuzz butt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Also, we're going to be updating the website with new pictures from Halloween, so you can see what we dressed up as. Mm -hmm. And you look pretty sexy with your shirt off. Thank you. (laughs) So, until next time, thanks very much for listening. Yes, thank you. And we will see you next week thank you for joining us this week it's always a pleasure talking to you just a quick reminder that kink geek and everything we do is supported by you our fantastic listeners via our patreon visit patreon.com and consider becoming a patron for access to all of our bonus content see you next time